Today we are in Fairhope, Alabama, 18 January 2011, to interview Joseph Gould, born Brunswick, Georgia, October 24, 1920. Joseph was a member of the United States Navy, having attained the rank of captain. I am Jim Jeffries, conducting the interview on behalf of the Veterans History Project in the American Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress. Good morning, Captain. Good morning, Jeff. Would you please uh, share some of your uh, early life experiences and uh, a little about your family? Uh, the mother and dad gave me a very good background. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I graduated from high school in uh, June of 1938 and entered the Naval Academy at Annapolis in June of 1939. I was in the class of 1943. Uh, in those days, we had a four year curriculum, but our particular class was accelerated and we finished in three years, so I graduated from Annapolis in June the 19th, 1942. Uh, it took a while uh, after a 30-day leave to catch up with the ship to which I was assigned. First assignment was to the USS Saratoga, an aircraft carrier, which was then in the Coral Sea. Uh, just incidentally, on the way trying to overtake the Saratoga, I was aboard a troop transport, the USS Zeiland, which participated in the invasion of the Solomon Islands on August the 7th, 1942. Uh, we were on the, uh, across Iron Bottom Bay, the Solomon Island Channel, from Guadalcanal, at little island called Tulagi, which was uh, the destination of the troops that we carried. At any rate, I caught up with the Saratoga later on, and, and about two weeks after I went aboard, the ship was torpedoed. Uh, we went back into Pearl Harbor eventually, and uh, stayed in dry dock for 30th, 35 days, and then went back to the South Pacific uh, during this time, uh, the uh, Navy was looking for naval aviators and submarine officers. I applied for submarine school and it was accepted. I became a submarine officer and served uh, two tours in uh, training submarines, old 1920 vintage S boats down in the Caribbean until the middle of 1945 when uh, we decommissioned the S-11 and I went to Guam to be in a relief crew. Uh, while in that relief crew, they took a group of us, about 45 I think it was, and uh, put us aboard another submarine tender and we headed toward Japan. I found out that the uh, we had heard about a big bomb being dropped in, <clears throat> in Japan, and on 7 August, of course, the A-bomb, the first one, was dropped on Hiroshima. On the 9th of August, the second was dropped on Nagasaki, and on the 15th of August of 1945, Emperor Hirohito made his, uh, his address from the Imperial Palace in Tokyo and indicated that Japan would toss in the towel, so to speak. Uh, they piled us aboard a submarine tender to go out and, and see uh, if we could find any Japanese submarines that, which had complied with the Allied powers dictate at the end of that 15 uh, August speech. The uh, Allies directed the Imperial Navy to have all the submarines at sea surface, dispose of their weapons, fly a black flag, and uh, surrender to the first Allied warship they encountered. Uh, one such warship was the USS Blue, a destroyer, 
and to which the submarine, Japanese submarine I-14 surrendered. Uh, we learned of this in the Proteus and we were the 45 of us plus a commander to, to whom we had reported a <clears throat> experienced uh, and experienced submarine commanding officer named uh, John S. McCain, Jr. Commander McCain uh, became our commanding officer of what we called a prize crew and we got on a destroyer escort, hauled off over the horizon and caught up with the blue and believe me, the largest submarine we had ever seen. The I-14, uh, as far as I know, it was completely unbeknownst to uh, naval, American naval intelligence that the Japanese had decided to build a fleet of 18 aircraft carrying submarines. <laughs> it seems, uh, sounds ludicrous, I know, but the, the uh, class that the I-14 belonged to, the I-13 and 14, carried only two aircraft, and a larger class, the I-400 class, carried three. Uh, so these uh, submarines would surface and the aircraft would take off from the submarine? The uh, aircraft were carried in a great bulbous 12-foot diameter hangar, which was built just forward of the conning tower of the submarine. The submarine had a catapult, and because submarines also had a crane on the port side with which they could lift the aircraft out of the water when the aircraft came back to the submarine from its mission. Uh, the I-14 was uh, 376 feet long, which is about 100 feet longer than a, an American fleet-type submarine. Uh, she displaced 3,700 tons and carried enough fuel to go around the world one and a half times. <laughs> the plan for these aircraft-carrying submarines, once they finished the fleet of 18, was they would uh, go and bombard the aircraft, would bomb uh, the west coast cities of the United States and then go on around and bomb New York City and Washington, D.C. Uh, they didn't complete the fleet, obviously, in, in time to, for that, so these three boats that we encountered, the I-14, I-400, and I-401, and their final mission was to bomb the Panama Canal. But uh, before they got to the canal, it looked as though the war was going to end. Their mission was changed to uh, kamikaze raids on shipping United States and Allied shipping at, at Ulithi. I think the Japanese decided that uh, that late stage in the war, the destroying the locks in the Panama Canal wouldn't do much good to deter our transfer of shipping to the Pacific. We already, the Allies already had about 3,000 ships. <laughs> it's amazing, these numbers. Uh -huh. About 3,000 ships in the Pacific altogether. At any rate, on the 28th of August, 1945, uh, Commander McCain and the rest of us went aboard this I-14 and took over from the handful of destroyer sailors who were riding around in the submarine not knowing what to do with it. And uh, we, my first assignment after we got aboard and got oriented a little bit was Commander McCain asked me to go take uh, the little Japanese translator we had with us, the little young ensign who had been raised in Japan as the son of missionaries from the United States. Then he was the Japanese linguist. He knew the Japanese language. He didn't know the, uh, the nautical terms very well, but we managed pretty well. And we went from stem to stern in the, in the I-14 and made sure that all the uh, munitions, ammunition, torpedoes, etc., were gone. Uh, 
the hangar was empty except for personal effects of, of uh, Japanese who had been killed on truck in other Japanese islands. The, uh, I guess they had used their two aircraft as kamikazes down at Ulysses before we caught up with them. At any rate, uh, we took the, the Japanese, drove the submarine back into Tokyo Bay with our, under our supervision. Uh, the, we lived on the tent submarine tender to which the uh, I-14 was moored until the uh, Japanese government decided what to do with all these leftover sailors and eventually we transferred them ashore and uh, made a few alterations in the accommodations of the of the I-14 so that we could inhabit the ship and uh, take it from there. Uh, by rearranging the accommodations, uh, the uh, they s Japanese crew slept on uh, pads, of course, on little sh wooden shells. Uh, we had to install some bunks for our uh, plush American sailors. Uh, I inherited the the second officer's stateroom on the uh, on the I-14. Uh, that was the chief engineer of the boat. They they had a slightly different sequence of seniority. The captain had his stateroom across the aisle from mine, and uh, I had my little stateroom, which was quite well uh, fitted out with a a writing desk and a chair and a cabinet and above a bookcase and a, a wooden foot locker at the end of the bunk in which you could hang up fancy uniforms and things like that. Uh, I found that the bunk was a little too short so we had to cut a hole in the side of the wooden locker at the end of the bunk so that I could get into it. <laughs> Just one of the little things that go on. In between the captain's stateroom and, and mine, aside from a, a, a door, a watertight door leading into the control room, uh, there was a, a, <coughs> excuse me, a shrine which the Japanese used and, and uh, would bow to each morning before they started their work. Uh, one incident that I think is always of interest to people is the fact that prior to the Japanese going ashore, Commander McCain wanted to be sure that everyone on board knew what, the, what their jobs were and what the different uh, instruments and gauges and hand wheels and things like that were that that uh, were all labeled in Japanese. And he got me one morning and said, Joe, I'm going to make an inspection of the ship tomorrow and commence at 0900. I want to be sure that these sailors have know what's going on. I want to label on everything on this boat that is in Japanese. I said, aye, aye, sir. And got hold of the chief of the boat, Chief Alger, and uh, he made sure that all the sailors labeled everything. We started our inspection the next morning at 0900 back aft. We started back aft and worked forward through the engine rooms and the, the battery compartments and things like that. And, and uh, it was obvious that the sailors took the instruction seriously because if they couldn't make a scotch tape hold on a greasy piece of equipment, there was a sailor standing there with a little sign saying what it happened to be, like diesel engine, for example, something of that sort. And we worked out that way forward until we came into the control room. Coming into the control room from the, the uh, engine room area, uh, we ducked through the watertight door and stood in the control room and looked around and 
there on the forward bulkhead of the compartment, up high was a, a large circular gauge, oh, about oh, 12 to 18 inches in diameter, and had uh, Arabic numerals around the periphery. And right across the face of this instrument was the English name for it, C-L-O-C-K. <laughs> Commander McCain looked at that. He couldn't suppress a grin. He turned to me and he said, I get the picture, secure from inspection. <laughs> and that was the end of that little charade. But he was a good man to work for. That was uh, the present uh, senator's father. Uh, Commander McCain was uh, uh, stayed with us until the Japan just before <clears throat> excuse me just before the Japanese went ashore, and uh, then he had orders back to the states. His father, Admiral McCain, was uh, terminally ill, and uh, so we were left without a commanding officer. For I became the CO for a few days until we got a new commanding officer, Hiram Cassidy another fully qualified submarine skipper and uh, uh, from Tokyo after we got rid of the Japanese we took the uh, I-14, 400 and 401, the two, three plane carrying boats around to uh, Sasebo, Japan on the west coast uh, and we stayed there until early December when uh, we finally got orders from the our Navy to take the boats back to Pearl Harbor. The hesitation had been for the Allies trying to decide what to do with the submarines and uh, also wanted to, we wanted to get them back to Pearl Harbor to investigate their technological advances, if any, and keep the Russians from getting hold of these these innovative type undersea uh, warships. Incidentally, uh, in addition to the three aircraft carrying submarines, uh, the I-13 uh, carried two aircraft, but she was in the shipyard at the end of the war and was not operational. The Japanese had 20, a total of 28 operational submarines, uh, some 23 of which they scuttled in the Sea of Japan about 40 or 50 miles west of Sasebo. Uh, the Americans and the Allies scuttled them. Uh, the other, uh, the five that we kept and took back to Pearl Harbor, were the three aircraft carrying submarines and uh, two uh, brand new attack type high speed submerged submarines. The American fleet type submarine, which is the one that, with which we fought the Pacific War, uh, submerged with, on batteries, uh, of course, you know, diesel, electric. They ran on diesels on the surface and on batteries submerged. And their top speed submerged was about nine knots. And that was uh, what we call the one hour rate. That would last about one hour and then the batteries were flat again and had to be recharged. These uh, two high, class, high speed submerged Japanese submarines, a new class, the 200 and 201 would do 22 knots. <laughs> Those were very innovative little guys. So they were very advanced. I beg your pardon? They were very advanced in their technology. They certainly were. Uh, we found that they had an excellent radar. Their uh, uh, gyro compass was a, a, a Dutch manufacturer and they had trouble with it. It had a variable error until uh, our chief of the boat, chief electrician's mate, Alger, uh, after we got into Sasebo, when 
we had verified the fact that the gyro compass had a variable error. Uh, LJ asked permission to tear the, side of the uh, gyro compass apart and put it back together and see what he could do with it. And uh, they had found a, an instruction book in German for the uh, gyro compass and they found a, a sailor on a submarine tenor that could read German. So they went right to work and sure enough, from then on, as, as I as navigator in particular was very happy with the fact that our gyro compass had an error, but it was permanent. Uh, and it was about two degrees west. And before it had varied from uh, three degrees west to five degrees east. And, and uh, that's no way to, to run railroads, so to speak. At any rate, they had this some very good equipment. They had snorkels on these uh, on these boats, so they could actually recharge their batteries while they were submerged. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they had a, a pentometer log, which is a speedometer for a ship, which was excellent and, and very very accurate. They had a depth finding sonar, which was very accurate. Uh, in fact, I used it quite a bit in navigating from Japan back to uh, to Guam when we had overcast most of the way and I couldn't get any star sights. But going back a little bit before the Japanese left the ship in, in Yokosuka, I approached the old Japanese commanding officer one morning. Oh, by the way, most people want to know how the Japanese behaved. And, and I can only say that uh, to start, they were, I guess, docile, and then they became friendly. Uh, I think they, the sailors from the blue had broken the ice with them and, and let the Japanese sailors realize that the Americans were not the monsters that some of the pro Japanese propaganda had pictured us. But at any rate, uh, I also learned that prior to World War II, the Japanese Naval Academy had required all the midshipmen at the Naval Academy to learn English. And that was about, they started that about six years before the, uh, they dropped uh, bombs on Pearl Harbor. But at any rate, the, uh, I approached the old Japanese skipper who was sitting up forward in a deck chair. I guess he was contemplating his future now that he was gonna be out of the Navy and uh, started a conversation with him. In the course of conversation, I asked him how long it took to, to bring the ship to the surface, uh, prepare the two aircraft, launch them, and uh, then submerge again. And he said, oh, seven or eight minutes. And uh, I said, well, how about at the end of their mission, how long does it take you to surface, uh, get the planes alongside, uh, swing them aboard with that hydraulic crane over there and shove them back into the hangar? We never tried that, was the answer that he gave. <laughs> so they were designed to be kamikazes, if nothing else. Uh, bringing the the I-14 from Yokosuka to Sasebo was no uh, great thing. We had some engine problems, but that turned out to be contaminated fuel in the main engines, and our engineers straightened that out. And uh, we had the variable error in the gyro compass, which Chief Algebra and his gang were able to straighten out. And we left, uh, we left Sasebo headed for Pearl Harbor, via Guam and then a wee talk uh, shortly before Christmas. Uh, we had Christmas dinner underway. Uh, Hiram Cassidy was, uh, had received shortly after he came aboard the I-14, I forgot to mention this, 
the commander of submarine forces Pacific from Pearl Harbor came out to to Japan and he looked over the I-14 among other things but he also brought along a decoration for uh, Commander Cassidy. Commander Cassidy had uh, had had command of the, the American submarine which had picked up the most aviators out of the water. <laughs> you remember uh, uh, President H. W. Bush, George H. W. Bush was was uh, a naval aviator. Yes, and he, sir. His aircraft was shot down, and a submarine plucked him out of the water. I don't know if it was Cassidy's boat, but uh, Cassidy was able to get the the largest number of aviators that, of any uh, submarine that made that type of patrol. And anyway, uh, he was a good man. He. Uh, Christmas morning we were in the wardroom having a cup of coffee and Hiram said uh, Joe Navy regulations say that uh, uh, prohibits the use of re recreation of alcohol aboard any ship of the United States Navy and I said yes sir and he said, this is not a ship of the United States Navy. This is a Japanese bucket of boats. Open, out, open up the medicinal alcohol and give it to the cooks and tell them to make a, a cup of eggnog to go around. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sure that was enjoyed by the crew. Oh. They loved Hiram Cassidy, believe me. I can imagine. And uh, so then when New Year's Eve came along and we were still at sea, uh, we didn't have any eggnog, eggnog but uh, we uh, did have a little celebration. Everybody got together and, and cheered to the end of the war in 1946. And all within regulations. Pardon me? And all within regulations. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Now, our trip back to Pearl Harbor was quite uneventful and I left the ship uh, shortly after we got back in late January of uh, 1946. I left in February and uh, went on from there. I was assigned to a American type submarine in, in, San, based in San Diego. So that was your homecoming at the end of the war, San Diego? I beg your pardon? I said, so your homecoming was at San Diego after the war then? Uh, my homecoming went to Los Angeles where my wife was. And, oh. and uh, uh, I had a little leave with her. We had had a, a loss in the family. And uh, so I went, I left in, in uh, February and rejoined her and then we went down to San Diego, where I served in the USS Blower for, uh, until, let's see, June, I got orders, and the Navy took a bunch of us lieutenants out of submarines and uh, gave us command of the amphibious type ships, landing ships, medium, landing ships, tank, and so on. The, uh, which had been commanded primarily by reserve officers during World War II, and now the reserve officers were all going home. In fact, the Navy was in, if you'll pardon the expression, was in such a mess at the end of World War II that my orders were written on, let's say on the 15th of May, and named the commanding officer of the landing ship of which I took command by name I was to relieve him of command of this LSM 449 and I found out after I got to the ship that on the 15th of May that young lieutenant had been out of the service for over a week but anyway uh, that's another story and so is the rest of my naval career. I finally retired in, uh, 
in 1965, on November 1965. And I had, uh, had had 23 years commission service. And shortly after I retired, they started commenced a Naval Junior ROTC program at uh, the high school in San Clemente, California. I applied for and was given the job, and I held that position for about nine years. And that was my my life in uniform. <laughs> well, that, that's very interesting and uh, very inspiring. Uh, if I'm right in my calculation, 23 years commissioned, uh, three years at the academy, and then nine years uh, Junior ROTC, you spent uh, 35 years in uniform serving your country. That's right. Which is an incredible career. Uh, what decorations did you receive uh, during your career, Captain? Really none personal. They were uh, unit and uh, theater decorations. Uh, uh, World War II area ribbons and uh, World War II occupation of Japan and uh, presidential unit citations for, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of the ships I was in, uh, Korean presidential unit citation, but I think everyone got to one of those for his service in, in, uh, during Korea. In incidentally, uh, following my, uh, I had the landing ship for about a year, and then I went to Naval Intelligence School and got into the intelligence business for a while. And the uh, Korean War came along and I became executive officer and navigator of a destroyer, and following which I got command of a destroyer escort, a smaller uh, version of a destroyer. And I had that for about a year and a half and went back into the intelligence business. And then during uh, Oh, 1958, I think it was, I got command of a destroyer. Uh, that was my third sea command. And uh, uh, I was at UCLA in the Naval ROTC business for a while. I, was in, I had the Naval Intelligence Office in Los Angeles for a couple of years. Uh, and. Uh, Oh, my last sea command was a, I got into the mine warfare business and and uh, my last sea command was a squadron of 15 ocean minesweepers. That was during the Vietnam War. And uh, I didn't get to go to Vietnam, but uh, we had to send a division. My squadron consisted of 15 ships and uh, three divisions of five each. and. We kept a division of ocean minesweepers in Vietnam uh, uh, on duty over there. Uh, my last tour was in Pearl Harbor again, which I I spent about half my career in shore duty and and ships based in Pearl Harbor. And uh, my last tour there was the I was the fleet intelligence officer, Pacific Fleet intelligence officer on the staff of uh, uh, Admiral Thomas Mora. And then I went into teaching high school and Naval Junior OTC and and we had uh, oh out of a uh, hundred students we had uh, oh I think six went to the Naval Academy and two or three to the Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, a couple of the Air Force Academy. I don't know how they went wrong, but <laughs> well, that, that's very. I enjoyed the Navy, Jim. I enjoyed the Navy. I can tell that, and for those not aware, you mentioned uh, the Presidential Unit Citation. Again, for those not aware, that is the highest decoration given to any unit in the United States military. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, as a veteran. Uh, to win the presidential unit citation epitomizes teamwork at all levels, from senior command right down to the lowest private seaman, uh, what have you. So I must, I must congratulate you on that. that. That's outstanding. Yeah, we had some good ones. I'm had sure some, you did. Some good sailors, believe me. 
Have you stayed in touch with some of your old uh, friends uh, from those days? Yeah, I'm still in touch with classmates from the Naval Academy, and and uh, uh, there's one fellow, well, Chief Alger that I mentioned, uh, wrote me at the Bureau of Naval Personnel. He saw me on the internet, my stepson, uh, who is retired just recently as a rear admiral, uh, put me on the internet and what they call the Navy log is part of the Navy uh, Memorial, that Lone Sailor Group Memorial Service. And I, my picture and my four top commands and things like that. And, and uh, he wrote to me at the Bureau of Naval Personnel and forwarded a letter to me. I was living in Hawaii with my son Katrina having chased me out of Ocean Springs, Mississippi, and uh, the letter caught up with me out there. That's part of another story which leads into the National Geographic documentary, Hunt for Samurai Subs, which they uh, completed in, in November of 2009. Unfortunately, Charlie Alger passed away just a couple of months before the uh, documentary was completed, but uh, they had uh, investigated using some information that Charlie Alger had and found the I-14 uh, south of Pearl Harbor in about 2,400 feet of water. The Hawaii Undersea Research Laboratory has two uh, deep diving research submersibles and uh, Terry Kirby and Steve Price were piloting the one that uh, went down and found the I-14. They had previously found the I-400. They just stumbled across it uh, looking for something else south of Pearl Harbor. But at any rate, that's a, another long story. Uh, any other questions, Jim? Uh, yes, sir. Can you share with us how having served during three wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, how that shaped your life and your attitude and outlook? How did it affect me? Yes, and, and, <laughs> your, and your outlook, and your perspective on this country. <clears throat> Jim, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> I'm a little patriotic. But let's talk about something else for a minute. All right, certainly. Uh, what have you been doing in the years uh, since you've been out of uniform? Uh, well, while I was teaching in high school, I also got, in, got a real estate license in California. And my second wife and I uh, owned a real estate business. and. Uh, I did that for about 20 years, and uh, then I sold that and retired and went back to Jekyll Island, Georgia, which is just off the coast of my hometown, Brunswick, and uh, stayed there for three or four years, and then we moved to Ocean Springs, Mississippi, because I only had two siblings on the East Coast, and she had five siblings here in Mississippi, so. Uh, I was outnumbered, <laughs> but uh, I've tried to stay as active as I can, and, and uh, one of the things I do to try to stay mentally active is, is, is I've always wanted to be a writer, and uh, I kind of fell short in the, in the novel business, so uh, the fiction. So I started writing poetry for some reason, but that goes way back. I, I still have uh, three poems I wrote when I was in the I-14. One pertaining to Sasebo, Japan, which all the sailors despised, and it comes out in that little uh, poem I wrote about that. Another was a uh, called Christmas Eve on the I-14, or the I-14 Christmas Eve, in which I was able to use the 
family name of each of the crew members. <laughs> uh, and the third was uh, uh, New Year's Eve at sea, which uh, gives a little bit of the how we felt. <clears throat> uh, December 31st of 1945. I'm sorry. Well, that's quite all right. And I know uh, one of the poems that uh, you wrote, which you uh, shared with me, which I shared with our American Legion post, and is also read into the record by the Baldwin County uh, Commission. And I believe uh, went into the congressional record, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. which is quite an honor. Yeah, I was very pleased with that. It's a poem called The Old Glory. Uh, I have turned a copy over to your museum here in case they would like to use it. But let's go to the Korean War. I've got one little more sea story that I think might interest people. Please do. May we do that? Yes, sir. Uh, 19, Christmas Day, 1951. I was executive officer and navigator of the destroyer Radford. Uh, we were in a task group in the Sea of Japan. Task group consisted of a carrier, a couple of cruisers, and about six destroyers. Uh, the cruiser and destroyers formed the screen protecting the carrier. Uh, that particular day, we had no flight operations for two reasons. One was the, the fact that it was Christmas Day, and the second reason was the fact that we were in a uh, northwesterly storm there in the Sea of Japan. The water temperature was around, oh, 38 or 40 degrees. Uh, the uh, wind was terrific, the seas were large, and uh, we had slowed, the commander of the task group had slowed the uh, onward speed of the, of the group in order to give these small boys, as they call the destroyers, a more comfortable ride, but still we did 12 knots, we were, the bow was going under the water and then tossing the waves all the way back down the main deck. Uh, when you have green water going down the main deck that way, you uh, prohibit the use of the main deck and have everyone use the boat deck, which is another level higher, it's about 10 feet higher, to go fore and aft on the, on the ship. And uh, we had done that, and still we were, well, I'll show you how cold the weather was. Uh, uh, the salt spray on the, on the boat lines, the falls, boat falls, we call them, the uh, ropes that raise and lower the lifeboat, uh, the salt spray would freeze on the on the rope itself. The uh, we had prohibited uh, use of the main deck, and uh, nobody was using it. They were all using the boat deck for four and a half passage. Excuse me. We had a raft on the port side. We had a line reel, a, a line on which we kept a large manila uh, ropes that we used to tie to the pier. Uh, it's about eight feet tall. It was secured at the upper and lower ends and stood vertically. One of the seas hit that sufficiently that it came loose at the top end and was banging around on the deck and uh, could have caused some more damage. The officer deck uh, requested and got permission to send a couple of men down to secure the, this uh, line reel. Uh, we sent a bosun mate second class and a, a seaman. Uh, they both put on life jackets and had safety lines tied around their waists and 
they went down the ladder to just forward of where the line reel was, and uh, they got it secured so that it was not banging around anymore, but it was lying flat on the deck and, and still. And uh, the uh, boatswain mate started back up the ladder and made it up to the to the boat deck. And the seaman was had one foot on the ladder, as I was told later. When another wave came crashing down the port side and uh, <clears throat> flipped the seaman outside of the lifelines. And he was dangling by his uh, safety line when another wave came and parted that line so that we had a man overboard on the port side in very rough weather. Uh, the lookout who had on the, up on the bridge who had been assigned that task had been keeping an eye on the two guys, and as soon as he saw Alexander flip outside the lifelines, he, he called man overboard, port side, and uh, the officer of the deck did all the right things. Uh, there's a maneuver that we had all been taught. I think it's, as I remember, it's called the Williamson turn. You stop the end of the screw on the side on which the man has fallen, and you put the helm over hard in that direction, that stops the suction of the water that might pull him under the hull of the ship and kicks the stern away from where the man has gone over, hopefully. And uh, once the ship has turned 90 degrees, you then reverse the procedure and make the circle the other way and come back through the water in which the man fell. Uh, it works fine in, in calm weather. In this particular circumstance, it didn't work that well. And of course, by this time, the skipper and I were both on the bridge, and uh, the commanding officer had taken charge of what was going on. But no matter what we did, we couldn't seem to get the ship close enough to the man so that we could throw a heaving line to him. We even tried a, a line throwing gun, which is a, like a shotgun. It has a, a projectile with a nylon line tied to the end and you use it to uh, get the line over to where you can pull a larger line afterward. But anyway, uh, we were unable to get to Alexander, the guy in the water, and uh, we were a little bit puzzled when a young ensign that we had just been aboard a few months came to us up on the bridge. His name was William P. Up the Grove. I'll never forget. Uh, Up he had been the, uh, the captain of the swimming team at the University of Michigan where he went through uh, college on the Naval ROTC program <laughs> and got his commission as an ensign in June of, of uh, 51. He, in other words, he was really a fresh caught young fellow, but he came and volunteered to swim out and get Alexander. Uh, Captain said, are you sure? And Buffy said, yes, sir. We put a life jacket on him. Uh, he stripped to his skivvies. He, we put a life jacket on him, tied a safety line around his waist, and uh, wished him Godspeed. And uh, you would have sworn that he had an outboard motor <laughs> 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 on his ankles when, when he took off. It, to make a long story short, he got to Alexander grabbed him, we pulled them both back aboard, and uh, our chief hospitalman, they call him chief pharmacy mates in those days, our chief hospitalman took the two young men back into the torpedo room and put a blanket on the steel deck and put them on the blanket. The uh, 
torpedo room being right above the fire room, and the deck was warm. And uh, these two young fellows were just blue with the cold, as you can well imagine. And uh, the chief hospitalman stayed with them and, and massaged them until they got the circulation uh, really going again. The uh, a little interesting sidelight to that, you know, my commanding officer, when he was ashore, was a, I think he, he drank a good bit. But uh, we got out the medicinal brandy just in case the, the boys needed something like that to warm them up, but they both declined. The, uh, so the captain and I decided that we had had an, a nerve-shocking trauma and we needed medicinal brandy, and we had a shot. <laughs> uh, we recommended Eftergrove for, I've forgotten what metal we recommended him for, and he got, uh, I think, the second highest life-saving metal that